Here we have a Dukoff, a vintage Dukoff. Does not say Miami on it, but it's an old one. Uh, you can't always tell by that. It's uh, compared to the new ones, they have a longer body, shorter shank. Um, there's some minor differences inside the throat. Um, a lot of them have uh, a little more open throat than the modern ones. I don't think that's significant because you can take a modern one and customize it a little more open. Uh, they're also not made very symmetric, uh, but they still work. Um, you know, if you look at them on the end, they sometimes look like they've been squashed one way. Still, guys like them. This particular one I've worked on several times. It had the tip opened, and then the owner had dropped it, bent it up. I repaired it, and he dropped it again, bent it. I fixed it up. Now it's back here again. And there's only so much you can do with these Dukoffs, and then the uh, the tip material just gets too thin. They won't. Uh, they become unrepairable uh, by the way that I had been doing it in the past. If you look at this one, you can see there's even a break all the way across, and that break lines up with the end of the bite plate where uh, you know the material steps down there, so the bite plate comes in. So from here out, you know, that's the thin spot. And the only thing holding the tip on now is a little bit of side rail on the left and the right. Um, it had been bent closed. Um, I could bend it out with my hand, my thumb. I didn't need to use pliers or a hammer. That's how fragile it was. So I was, I was going to send it back to the client like this. And he also sent me another mouthpiece that was thin, but not as bad as this. It hadn't broken through, but I could also bend that with my hand. But I, I decided, hey, rather than pronounce these dead, since it was a favorite mouthpiece of the uh, client, let me take a shot at fixing it. What I came up with is this. I applied, uh, this one needed a new bite plate, and after I put the bite plate in, I said, what if we extended the bite plate material all the way to the tip over this fragile thin area and kinda it makes it a little duck build um, but it's still comfortable to play so I ended up with something that I think works quite well it gives you uh, a lot more material right over that thin spot and uh, I think it probably could even take a hit though I don't recommend dropping any mouthpiece um, but you know things happen so, I'm going to show you how I did that on this one. Okay, here's my other station where I do all my bite plate repairs. Clamp this baby up. The material I use is an acrylic powder. It's sold in the beauty supply industry for uh, fake fingernails. Um, I don't I'm not tied into any particular brand. I keep trying different ones, but um, if you search on Amazon, you can usually find a black acrylic. Um, and then I would buy, you know, a name brand monomer. This made a big difference. I had purchased a, a cheap set at one time, and I didn't didn't like the way it worked. So uh, when I I used that all up, but uh, this is a sassy acrylic liquid. Uh, I haven't tried a lot of them, but I, I would rebuy this one because I like the way way it works. Some powders uh, have a gummy feel to them, and when you're trying to work with them, uh, the Gardala Dental Acrylic, which you can't buy anymore, but I have a supply of that, work, flows real nice. This stuff with a cheap monomer, uh, monomer uh, acrylic liquid, um, it's horrible to work with. With this, it's tolerable. It's not as good as the, the Gardala stuff. Um, now, the way I've, I've used this in previous vi videos um, is dipping uh, a brush um, into, you know, a little crucible of the, the liquid and then into the uh, powder. Um, but I'm going to show you a different technique. I use the brush a little bit to uh, apply the liquid. So I have that monomer in a little squeeze bottle here. Put a couple drops on a brush and kind of wet the area you want to use. Uh, apply it to. Then I actually have these uh, little measuring spoons that are 
Uh, we never used them for cooking. They're labeled dash, you know, pinch, and things of that sort that you can do by hand. But so I use just a little, sp and you sprinkle it on there. Now it's going to be dry. You can mask off the area if you want, but you can see I'm not doing that. Oops, I just dropped some. I try not to waste any, but sometimes that happens. So a couple more drops on the brush, and just touch it to try to wet it. If you uh, touch the powder directly, it's going to adhere to the brush, but it's not. A, sometimes you got you got to get it wet. Okay, so I got that started. It's still pretty wet. I hold hold this underneath in case I, you know, miss catch, catches the powder. I do this for bite roughing in bite plates too with this material, and then I kind of finish them off with the brush, or I even sometimes uh, if it's too lumpy looking, I'll put a a little piece of uh, you know cling wrap on top and uh, rub it massage it around and sometimes I leave the wrap on there sometimes I peel it off you can just leave it on there till it dries and, and peel it off later um, but with this material you pretty much have to always uh, do some filing and sanding to get it to the shape you want the uh, Gardala material I sometimes can paint it on there and and uh, it'll be all when it sets it'll be already smooth and ready to go but even with that material, to get the best looking job, it's better to overfill it and then file it and sand it down. See, layer by layer, you add it up. I think with this one, I'm going to go further up trying to make a duck build. The other one I repaired, I pretty much only left it down here. Um, but I'm going to go a little further with it. So I had already bent this one back to uh, uh, rough it in at a tip opening. And so this is going to lock that pretty much in place. And then I'll still have to do some facing work on it to make sure um, everything else is right because you know, there might be a little kink here that I now can take some material off because I have some additional strength from this acrylic. This acrylic dries pretty stiff. You know, it's very, it's like the bite plate material used uh, in most mouthpieces. You know, some use different, different things. But, you know. Once in a while you got to go back and uh, after it sets and you're working on it, you'll, you'll, You'll file it away and there'll be a low spot you can't really deal with. Then you come back to the station and add a few more. Now this um, sets pretty quickly. Um, probably in 15 minutes it can be worked on. I usually let it go a little longer than that. But uh, you can also uh, put a heat gun on it and um, you know bake it that way. So you see I didn't really have to uh, this time paint the material on. I sometimes do that. Well, it's got a little lump here. But, you know, as it sets, it gets gummy and it's tougher to work with. The other thing I do is uh, wipe the sides since we're not masked off. Some of that liquid has gotten on the side and some might get on the bottom, but usually scrapes off with a fingernail pretty easily once it's set. And I've been asked, is this stuff safe? Well, they they use it on ladies' fingernails. You know, they play it right on there. And uh, uh, that doesn't mean it's safe, but it is used on humans. Um, there's some uh, debate as to whether or not that's a good practice or not. Uh, I think it's more risk to me than it is to you, the final player. Once it sets, it's pretty inert. Um, it's this liquid that has a, a lot of warnings on it. Uh, not to handle it, uh, but even you know in the beauty industry they use that to uh, with the paintbrush technique to apply this to ladies' fingernails, and um, uh, you have to decide whether uh, that bothers you or not. You know, but it's it's the same kind of material that's used in the mouthpiece uh, mouthpiece uh, made at the factory. So 
I don't, I'm not that concerned with it. Okay, we'll let that set. I have to clean my brush off. Um, use a, a rag to pull off most of it. A couple more drops of the uh, monomer. So I use a lot less monomer this way. When I was uh, putting it in a crucible and dipping my brush into it, um, you'd end up with a, a amount of waste that you, you couldn't use. And you had to dump it out. Plus it smells as it evaporates. And you want this in a in a room you don't walk into after a while until everything evaporates. The fumes are pretty pretty strong. You don't want to do it in your kitchen unless you live alone. <laughs> okay, there we have it after the material, the acrylic is set. It's a little rough. So I'm going to start off with a double O cut file. It's fairly coarse. Uh, this is a Grobet, G-R-O-B-E-T, Grobet file, Swiss made, and there's the double O on there. So, You usually can clean it off against you know, a rag, but if otherwise if it kind of gets clogged, you use this file card, as they call it. And you can clean off your file against that. You see all the high spots clean off, clean up first. You know, if you find you have a deep low spot, you have to go back and fill it in with more acrylic. Okay, I've been at this 10 or 12 minutes or so. It's roughed into shape pretty nice. So I'm switching from the double O file to a single O. Um, these are Val Titan files, also made by Grobey, I, be I believe. Um, but they're a much harder steel. These are these are nice files. They're, they're about 10, 12 bucks a pop, but they last a long time. Good, good for everything. You can even work on some stainless steel with them, but that will dull them. But if you just stick to brass, uh, one of these will last a long time. So you can do just some mild shaping with this file. Uh, you should stick with the coarse one as much as you can. And use now just more or less you're trying to get out the file marks from the previous file. And some minor shaping. This also would be better for uh, trying to feather the edge or taper the edge into the into the mouthpiece. Do it like this, a little bit on the round side. Okay, move to the. This is a number two. I don't think they make a number one that I know of. They go two then four, and it's a finer file. Most of my files I have, I have a number of shapes of these. I mostly have them in O, but occasionally I have a double O. And I think this is this is my only number two that I have a fine, but I use this a lot, half round number two. Use it to shape tip rails and, you know, do some fine work. So it's my workhorse. If you only buy one file, it would be this one because you can do, you know, it's a nice, this is a, the uh, O, uh, half round tapered needle file. And 
you know, if you put me on a desert island and said that's you, you only pick one file, that's the one because uh, it's between fine enough and coarse enough to do the, all all your shaping. Says I just do a lot of fine tuning work like this. Also, that would be my second choice, but I could live without it. Just use sandpapers in the other file. Speaking of sandpapers, it's time to go to sandpaper. So I start off, I usually keep the uh, swatches of uh, sandpaper ready to go, and this is a used one, but it's still got enough grit on it. This is a, uh, I have a 2 on there with which marks it as a 220. And you can still do some shaping with this. So this is very much similar to finishing a bite plate, only uh, I, I really don't want to scratch the surface a lot, but some of it's unavoidable. But if you, um, you know, were de dealing with a plated piece, it'd be good to mask it off or plan on getting it replated or maybe you just don't care. Okay, next I go to my 300, which is really probably 320. Now you're not really shaping a whole lot, you're mostly getting the scratches out from the previous grit. And I'll finish up with 600. Okay, I stop at 600 grit for sandpaper. You could go to 800 or 1,000, but I just find it doesn't do a whole lot. Then I switch to a 4-0 um, steel wool. Make a little pad. A lot of elbow grease. So, steel wool leaves a nice enough finish, you probably could leave it like that uh, if you're more worried about playing it only. Um, yeah, if you're worried a little bit about looks, next thing I use is a polishing compound. This is uh, like an automotive rubbing compound. Um, I'll use a little swatch, a little rag, but I get a cleaner one. Throw that away. You know, I keep a bunch of these pre-cut in a pile. Just fold up and make it a little pad out of a rag. A little dip on this. This is like an abrasive paste. I use this on mostly hard rubber mouthpieces as I work on them uh, to restore the you know shine to them. So this gets out 
getting micro scratches from the steel wall. See? And uh, next step is you take it to a buffing wheel or you could hand polish it. I don't remember, I, I don't recommend using this rubbing compound all extensively on the metal. Uh, the metal's soft and it just never sh never stops. It keeps smearing and getting cloudy. Um, so better just to, you know, yeah, you can polish it a little bit with a polish. And I'll do that when I'm all done. But even then, you can just keep polishing and polishing away and more and more silverite is going to release. But, uh, yeah, I like that shape. Um, you know, I think that's going to be real comfortable to play on. You can see it's... Uh, it's got a good amount of meat down here where the, the tip was fragile. Um, in fact, I'll even try to measure it. Right where the crack is, I probably have 113,000. So 125 is an eighth of an inch. So it's just under an eighth of an inch thick in the middle there where the thinnest part was. And before I started, it was more like, you know, well, actually, we have a crack, so at, at least uh, where the bite plate was, you know, there was, uh, it doesn't matter what it really measured because there was a crack through it all the way, but, you know, I would say uh, uh, probably a good sixteenth of an inch was, was built, built up on top of that. Okay, i got to check the facing and uh, uh, do some adjustments on that and... Uh, We'll be able to ship it off. Okay, facing measured decent. Um, I had to you know, clean up the table a little bit. Now, um, uh, you know, the tip rail had to be detailed, so I started doing that. Um, you know, I had already worked on this mouthpiece before it had been dropped a couple times, so a lot of a lot of it still was correct. I mean, the tip was flopping all over the place, which it isn't now, but now that I have the tip locked in place, I can detail the tip rail, again using my number two file, the outside was previously shaped using a reed template, you can just use a reed for this, but yeah, that's still a good shape, so otherwise if it wasn't, you can thin the rail the tip rail from the outside. See as I, I thin this from the inside it's starting to break through and I'm seeing a little bit of black, black acrylic peeking through the, where I uh, you know filled that in and gave it some strength. So but it's, it's feeling pretty good now. Now uh, sanding sticks. Minor nicks, just from years of use, inside the tip rail, a little on the outside, just pretty all that up a little bit. Steel wall. Okay, and a final polish on the back of sandpaper.
Yeah, I'll, I'll mess with it cosmetically a little longer, but um, I think we've salvaged a dead Dukov. <laughs>